Welcome to Osiris, the first mummy. The oldest mummies recovered date from the Old Kingdom, though Egyptologists believe that mummification was in use much earlier than that. At first, the body was mummified through environmental desiccation by leveraging the dryness of the environment and the heat of the climate. Early experimentations in mummification were conducted with the use of resin made from tree sap. Strips of linen were only used on some superficial parts of the epidermis of the hands or jaw. Ideologically, the will to preserve the body is not explained in any way until 3600 BCE. This is when the Egyptian belief that the body housed the soul was finally documented for modern Egyptologists to eventually decipher. It was not until the arrival of the myth of Osiris in the Egyptian religion around the 5th dynasty that mummification was thoroughly conceptualized. The practice was thereafter grounded in both a mythological and ideological point of view. Osiris was mainly known as the god of the dead and the god of resurrection. The most well-known Genesis myth concerning Osiris is that of his dismemberment. It is Plutarch who gives the most simplified and complete summary of the story. Within Egyptian mythology, Osiris represented the first king to rule Egypt. Jealous of his power, his brother Seth attempted to usurp his throne. After several unsuccessful attempts, Seth succeeded in killing his brother by dismembering him and scattering the pieces of his body all over Egypt. Iset, the great of magic, traveled all over Egypt in search of the pieces of her husband's body. After a long search, she recovered all the pieces save for his manhood, as it was eaten by a fish. Iset then reassembled the body of her husband by binding it together with strips of linen. Aided by her sister Nephthys, another powerful magician, they gave Osiris the breath of life. This not only brought him back from the dead, but also allowed him to recover his virility long enough to impregnate Iset, thus ensuring his succession before, once more, dying. Thus Horus was born. The ritual used to bring Osiris back to life essentially depicts how he became the first mummy. It is why, on the sarcophagi of kings, we often find Iset and Nephthys represented as the magicians who restore life to the deceased. Welcome to Mummies of Ancient Egypt. The mummification process used by ancient Egyptians was highly ceremonial in nature. The different types of mummification took into account the social level and richness of the deceased and even included animals. The most expensive was that reserved for the pharaoh and the royal family, as well as some of the wealthiest members of the court. The first step was cleaning. Once bodies arrived at the mummification site, they were placed on inclined tables while the bodily fluids drained away. They were then cleansed by priests until they were deemed ready for the purification process. The purification of the body began with a libation from sacred water. The priests then fumigated the body with terebinth resin. After the ritual cleansing, priests used oils, spices, and all kinds of essences to further purify the body of the deceased. Finally, all body hair was meticulously removed. Mm -hmm. 
Once the body was properly purified, embalmers removed the organs, following very specific procedures. First, the brain was extracted by inserting a spoon through the nostril to break the ethmoid bone. Then using a spatula, the pieces of the brain were removed as thoroughly as possible. What matter remained was extracted after a process of liquefaction, achieved through the use of a caustic liquid. The cranial box, once emptied, was rinsed and disinfected with palm wine, and then stuffed with strips of linen cloth and liquefied resin. After taking care of the brain, embalmers made an incision on the left flank and carefully set aside the viscera. The inside of the body was also rinsed with palm wine. Then the embalmers filled the belly with pure myrrh, cinnamon, and other perfumes and sewed it shut. The removed viscera were washed in palm wine and packed in crushed herbs before being placed in canopic jars. Canopic jars were placed close to the sarcophagus or kept in a chest nearby. At first, the viscera were wrapped in tissue and placed in the vases. As the ritual requirements became more elaborate, ointments, spices, and even water and natron were added to the process. Towards the middle of the New Kingdom, canopic jars assumed the appearance of the four sons of Horus. They were known as the protectors of the viscera. These protectors had their own guardians, each a goddess of the dead. Imseti, the human-headed god, protected the liver and was protected by the goddess Iset. Happy, the baboon-headed god, protected the lungs and was protected by the goddess Nephthys. Dumuthef, the jackal-headed god, protected the stomach and was protected by the goddess Neith. And finally, Kebisenuef, the falcon-headed god, protected the intestines and was protected by the goddess Selket. Natron is a naturally occurring mineral found in evaporite. These sedimentary rocks are made up of mineral salts and were generally mined from lake beds in Egypt. Embalmers used natron as a desiccant to dry the flesh and stop the corpse's putrefaction process. Once the body was cleansed and eviscerated, the deceased was covered in natron for about 40 days. Once desiccated, the body was prepared to be wrapped in strips of linen. Once the body was fully desiccated by the natron treatment, embalmers oiled, painted, and sometimes even added hair extensions or a wig. They often used a henna-based antiseptic preparation to give the body a more colorful and lively appearance while preparing it to resist molds and fungi. Next came the phase which gave mummies their most well-known appearance, the wrapping. Originally, each part of the body was wrapped separately. Men had their arms crossed on their chests, while women had the right arm folded over their breasts and the left arm stretched along the body. However, techniques evolved over time. Eventually, the body as a whole was wrapped with limbs alongside the body, and increasingly sophisticated and different techniques of weaving flax bands were developed. In addition to the jewelry and amulets arranged on the skin of the deceased, amulets were also carefully inserted into the weaving of the linen strips. Each amulet was linked to a myth or to an ideological belief related to rebirth. Masks were an important part of a mummy's finery. Early wooden funeral coverings were very expensive, however, and soon replaced by masks created through a technique known as cartonage. Masks fashioned with this method were created by laying several layers of linen or papyrus pulp on a base made of mud or straw. Cartonage was used for more than funerary masks. Ornaments and the animal coffins of the late period were also made in such a fashion. 
Cartonage evolved to cover the entire body of the mummy during the 22nd dynasty. The mummies were placed on a board inside a rigid envelope of cartonage, which was laced at the back with a string. Extremely cost-effective and visually pleasing, this technique was very popular through all layers of the society. Cartonage envelopes were usually covered with inscriptions and polychrome decorations, specifying the names and titles of the deceased, scenes depicting daily life, or decorations specific to the funerary world. This was a true gift for Egyptologists eager to study the funerary rites of the ancient Egyptians. Once the mummy was properly wrapped and adorned, the embalmers proceeded with the ceremony of the opening of the mouth. A vital step of the funerary process, this ceremony was meant to bring back to life the deceased themselves or an object representing the deceased. There were no less than 75 different stages for the opening of the mouth. It required the application of the same oils, ointments, spices, and perfumes used during the mummification process. Makeup was sometimes part of the process as well. The last stage of this long ritual was the act of touching the mouth with the ads to symbolically allow the breath of life to infuse an inert body. Its performance was reserved for a very specific set of people. Priests who wore the mask of the god Anubis, a close relative of the family, or by the heir to the throne. Welcome to The Importance of Mummies. The first hieroglyph for embalmer appeared in pyramid texts of the Old Kingdom. It is likely that embalming was a trade that progressed alongside the evolution of ancient Egyptian funeral practices. While we still know nothing of how embalming came to be a profession, we do know that embalmers had a hierarchy and that each embalmer specialized in a specific phase of the mummification process. The mummification techniques were jealously guarded by embalmers from generation to generation. Despite their efforts, Herodotus and Diodorus discovered their methods in late antiquity, but historians were skeptical about the validity of the texts. It remained a mystery until two teams of modern medical legal scientists confirmed the process in 1994 and again in 2011. The Uabet, meaning the pure place, was where the embalmers mummified the bodies of the deceased. Until the end of the Middle Kingdom, it was located in tents at the edges of the city due to the smell of decomposition. In the New Kingdom, however, the Uabet was located within the city limits, though still in open-air spaces. In the same way that the practices and techniques of mummification evolved, so possibly did consideration towards embalmers within ancient Egyptian society. The pharaoh had access to the most elaborate of mummification rituals. The richer citizens of Egypt also enjoyed complex embalming options, though none of them allowed for the removal of the brain or viscera. After purifying the body, embalmers injected a liquid through the rectum, sealed it, and allowed the mixture to settle. They then plunged the body into natron for up to 40 days. Once the body was dried, the seal was removed, and the entrails flowed out with the injected liquid leaving the skin and bones of the deceased to be wrapped in linen and returned to the family for burial. The least costly embalming option was for the embalmers to simply inject a product called surmaya, 
and immerse the body in the natron for up to 40 days before handing it over to the family. For all those who could not afford any embalming process, desert burials offered a pauper's alternative to preserve the bodies of the dead. Egyptian civilization has always appealed to Westerners, even before the Greek and Roman invasions. As early as the Middle Ages, mummies discovered by travelers were often sent back to Europe. Curio cabinets, dating from the 16th and 17th centuries, usually included pharaonic artifacts in their collections. The Egyptomania phenomenon was heralded by Napoleon Bonaparte's Egyptian campaign, which lasted from 1798 to 1802. The following years were marked by a resurgence of interest from rich enthusiasts and scholars who exposed Egypt to the general populace. Many research societies focusing on Egyptology were founded during those years. By 1868, mass tourism began in Egypt under the aegis of the Cook Agency. The rich would indulge in leisure trips to Egypt and bring back mummies. Upon their return, they would organize evenings that consisted of unpacking mummies and removing strips of linen and amulets layer by layer. These were considered the shining cultural events of the season. The Egyptian collections of many a museum were founded as a consequence of this mass pillaging. Thanks to those dubious parties, the fantasy of a mummy coming back to life, seeking revenge on its defilers, was born. The mummy malediction myth has remained steady in popular culture ever since, particularly in written media and cinema. Welcome to Amulets and Rituals. Ancient Egyptians believed the world was a chaotic place, filled with supernatural forces. They knew that art and words gave life and power to things. Carved with images from hieroglyphs or in the shapes of gods, amulets were highly personal objects that warded off dangers and disease while attracting success. Some amulets were temporary, intended to solve a specific problem, while others were meant to be worn forever into the afterlife. Priests would infuse amulets with magical energy during religious ceremonies, imbuing them with protective magic to safeguard against supernatural powers. The wealthiest of Egyptians could obtain a divinely ordained pendant in which was hidden a magic formula inscribed on a piece of papyrus. It would act as a unique spell tailored to the owner. Religion was so important to ancient Egyptians that it permeated every aspect of their daily lives. Since water was the source of life and had the symbolism of purifying the body and the soul, all daily routines began with ablutions. Personal prayers to the gods were sometimes written or spoken, with family prayers passed down through generations. There was a complete calendar of each of the religious days, both good and bad, illustrating the appropriate daily rituals. Along with wine, milk, and ointments, Offerings to the gods consisted of small amulets to life-size statues and family shrines. During the Greco-Roman period, offerings to the gods consisted of mummified animals, cats for Bostet, dogs for Anubis, and birds for Thoth. Deemed messengers of the gods, oracles offered guidance and judgment for all Egyptians, regardless of status. 
Crucial advice was offered on everything from day-to-day -day farming management to a pharaoh's decision on whether to start a war. Oracles were often used to decide legal issues. If the accused refused the judgment of the god, another god could be consulted in hopes of a more favorable reply. It was oracles that guided the Greek sailor Batos to the coast of Libya, where he founded a colony known as Cyrene. During Alexander the Great's campaign to conquer Persia, he consulted the oracle at the temple of Amun within the oasis of Siwa, and was subsequently ordained a divine being. Welcome to Temples and Rituals of Ancient Egypt. During rituals and festivals, the god was carried on a solar barge between the areas of a temple or the temples of different cities. Funerary carvings and paintings covering thousands of years, as well as the Book of the Dead, depict the same ship and ore design. Solar barges have been uncovered near or within several pharaoh's tombs. They were intended to carry the pharaoh into the afterlife. Ancient Egyptians believed that Ra, the sun god, traveled the skies in a boat known as the Solar Barge. The Solar Barge was believed to cross over to mythological lands. The god Ra believed mankind was conspiring against him. He ordered Sekhmet, the lion-headed war goddess, to kill all humans. To his chagrin, Ra quickly realized that with all humans gone, there would be no one left to worship him. In order to stop the rampaging Sekhmet, beer was brewed and dyed red with pomegranate juice to resemble blood. Sekhmet drank every drop of the brew she could find, eventually passing out drunk. When she awoke, she was calmer, and her lion visage had changed into Bastet. The festival of drunkenness was celebrated in honor of that myth. Unlike the daily rituals that took place in the temple and were performed by priests, festivals allowed the entire population of the city to participate. Festivals helped mark the passing of the seasons in the agricultural calendar. In reflecting the cycles of life, festivals offered a sense of consistency and structure for the regular citizens, thus reinforcing the sense of order that pharaohs were to provide for the citizens of Egypt as part of their godly duties. The importance of these festivals is demonstrated by their longevity. Records show that Osiris festivals occurred for more than 2,000 years. Some festivals serve to reinforce state control and promote the king's reign. Both the Opet and Sed Jubilee festivals were specifically intended to celebrate the renewal of the king's power. The temple hierarchy consisted of high priests, several types of priests, scribes, and servants. The high priest was known as the prophet. Some divinities had up to four prophets, and they were the ones to perform the most advanced and complex rituals. Egyptian priests were not confined to solely religious tasks, and in fact had crucial roles in Egypt's administration, most of which served to reaffirm the pharaoh as the proper vessel for the gods. Their focus within the temple was centered on the proper conduct of daily divine rituals, rather than as custodians of dogma or the indoctrination of individuals. Scribes were custodians of the sacred sciences. Some priests were associated with the funeral rites and were considered the group with medical knowledge. The servants of the Ka were low-ranking priests, who carried food and offerings in funerary rituals. Lector priests were distinguished by their ability to read 
and their main duty was to recite specialized religious texts in both temple and funerary rituals. Priests and all the officials who served the temple worked only three months a year, with each period separated by a quarter of inactivity, at least within the temple compound. Each outgoing group handed over the temple and their tools to the newcomers. The most sacred part of the temple was referred to as Jesser Jesseru, the Holy of Holies. The most sacred inner sanctuary was where the shrine to the temple deity was located. Only priests were allowed within. Offerings were given and rituals unseen by even the pharaoh were performed. While the team chose to allow any character access to this space in some game temples, normally it was reserved for priests alone. Pharaohs and their priests often chose the site of these sacred temples because of some mythological connection or an alignment with the cardinal points and certain stars. Once selected, a foundation ritual was performed. The pharaoh was required to complete 10 steps in the ritual, which required a mix of offerings as well as specific construction techniques. Once the temple was complete, construction of the chamber containing the shrine, or naos, began. The naos was where the god statue stood. The representation of the deity was usually in stone or wood and decorated with gold, silver, and precious stones. Smaller temples had only one naos, while larger complexes such as the Temple of Karnak had many chambers to honor gods, such as Amun, Ta, and Osiris. Each statue was believed to be a receptacle for the presence or essence of the god's Ka, enabling it to take a physical form. Through the statue, the god came to the shrine to eat, drink, and communicate with the pharaoh, or with the priests standing in for the pharaoh. Welcome to Temples and Priests. From its foundation, the city of Memphis favored worship of the god Ta. The main temple of Ta was known as Hutkapta, meaning Palace of the Ka of Ta. The name of the temple, translated into Greek as Egyptos, would eventually evolve into the modern name Egypt. Temples were the center of religious, political, and economic life in ancient Egypt. These sacred places were viewed as the literal home of the gods and goddesses. As such, every aspect of them required care and reverence, all of which was accomplished through elaborate ritual. Located in the center of Memphis, the Temple of Ta was the most prominent and imposing building in the city. The long walkway leading toward the temple, known as the Dromos, was guarded by rows of sphinxes. The entire sacred area was designed to keep the statue of the god protected deep within the sacred enclosures that surrounded it. The Dromos opened into a courtyard, with the surrounding portico graced with columns carved to resemble palm trees. During special festivals, the general population was allowed to enter this location, but under no circumstances would they be allowed into the sacred spaces beyond the courtyard. The Memphis Alabaster Sphinx was discovered in 1912, almost completely buried in water and sand. Eight meters in height and weighing in at roughly 90 tons, it is still mounted on its original pedestal. 
Though it is called the Alabaster Sphinx, it was in fact carved from common calcite rock, which is similar in appearance and texture to alabaster. Erosion has destroyed the original engravings, making it difficult to determine when it was created. Egyptologists believe that its facial likeness resembles Amenhotep II, and so it could have been sculpted somewhere between 1700 and 1400 BCE. It is believed that this monument once stood outside of the Temple of Ta and was integrated into subsequent extensions to the complex. The size of the imposing sculpture reflects the importance it had to the temple during the New Kingdom. This Sphinx is one of the few remaining artifacts from the ruins of Memphis to survive. In Egyptian culture, some animals were associated with gods, while others were considered to be living gods. The Apis bull was believed to be a divine entity. The earliest mention of the Apis bull in ancient Egypt goes back as far as the first Egyptian dynasty. <coughs> Originally the symbol of fertility, the Apis bull was linked to the god Ra, with the image of the sun carried between its horns. Later, it was associated with Osiris, the ruler of the underworld, thus becoming the funerary divinity Osorapis. During the 18th dynasty in Memphis, the Apus Bull's association with the city's deity earned it the title Herald of Ta. The Apus Bull was so revered that even Alexander the Great, upon his arrival in Memphis, gave honor to Apus. The Apus bull lived with its harem in a sacred barn located in an enclosure in the Temple of Ta. Each bull bore 29 signs representative of its divinity. Among them, the bull had an eagle-shaped mark on its back, a double tail hair, and a scarab-shaped mark under the tongue. The signs were intended to correspond with the lunar cycle. After its death, Egyptians would search for its reincarnated form among the livestock. Like other living divinities, the mortal incarnation of the Apus bull was prayed to, and when it died, it was given a luxurious funeral, which included mummification. Until the reign of Ramses II, the Apus bulls were buried in individual graves in Saqqara. During the 26th dynasty, the bodies of the bulls were buried in enormous stone vats in the underground corridors of the Serapium of Memphis. Ancient Egyptians believed that temple rituals were essential to maintain order in the cosmos and allow communication between humans and gods. The pharaoh was required to bring offerings as part of a twofold promise made to the gods to remain a just ruler and to prevent chaos from entering Egypt. Details of the ceremonies found on temple walls provide a thorough overview of the stages of the daily ritual. Performed three times a day to mirror human mealtimes, each step of the highly symbolic ceremony was accompanied by specific recitations, many of which referred to mythical events. The high priest would first awaken the sleeping god with a chant. Then the seals of the shrine's doors were broken and the bolts drawn back. The act of swinging open the doors was a symbolic gesture where sight was granted to the deity. The priest would then bow and kiss the ground. The god was then washed with incense-infused water and its mouth rinsed with mineral salts. 
The cleansing was followed by adorning the statue with jewels and royal garments. The final ritual required the priest to sweep away any footprints in order to prevent evil from approaching the god. Heredity was the primary source of new recruits. Rarely was an outsider allowed this position. At the top of the temple hierarchy was the high priest. Each temple dedicated to a god had at least one high priest devoted to its care and service. During the Ptolemaic dynasty, one family held the position of high priest in Memphis for almost 300 years. High priest candidates made their way up the ranks of the temple hierarchy. The one chosen to occupy the lofty position of high priest was usually confirmed by the pharaoh. Several of the high priests were also important officials in the government. Families sharing the highest priesthood titles tended to make many alliances, thereby gaining more land and wealth. Shifting balances of power sometimes resulted in more or less open conflicts between the priesthood and the pharaohs. In the 21st dynasty, Thebes became the capital of an almost entirely theocratic government. The city was headed by king priests who spoke and governed in the name of the god Amun, in open opposition to the ruling pharaohs. These king priests caused a massive decentralization of power, known as the Third Intermediate Period. The educational institution in ancient Egypt was known as the House of Life. Attended by the offspring of the elite and the clergy, it was a place tailored to the social status of its attendees. The earliest references to this type of institution date back to royal decrees of the Old Kingdom. Only two known centers have been uncovered, one in the abandoned city of Akhetaten and one at the temple of Ramses II on the west bank of Thebes. Inscriptions uncovered in those locations mention the names and titles of people who were connected with the House of Life such as a chief physician and many scribes. It is presumed that by the late kingdom, every temple had a house of life. The house of life offered training for the elite destined for occupations such as astronomers, doctors, veterinarians, diplomats, architects, translators, or theologians. Some institutions focused on specific disciplines, making them a central hub for the country. Not limited to instruction for young students, the House of Life was a source of reference for many scholars, with rooms dedicated to papyri of many disciplines. Because papyri were preserved there, the Greco-Romans referred to the House of Life as a library. <coughs> Ancient Egyptian economy was based on an unequal system of redistribution of goods. The state of Egypt collected the crops and the temples distributed them throughout the provinces. Since the only people capable of counting and ensuring a fair redistribution were the educated scribes, this meant that the temples played a pivotal role in this process. There are records of pharaohs making offerings of large tracts of land and animals to temples in order to maintain their favor. Ramses III offered generous gifts to the temple of Amun in Karnak in such a manner. Palaces, warehouses, and granaries were built inside the temple compound to better control the redistribution of goods. The size of the recorded numbers of goods, combined with every other function filled by temples, 
only serves to confirm their might as economic, religious, and political centers of power within Egypt. Welcome to Building Ancient Egypt. Constructed with bricks made of mud, most ancient Egyptian buildings were not permanent. Only religious temples and funerary monuments were meant to stand the ravages of time. For these very important structures, Egyptians used limestone, sandstone, and harder materials, such as granite, quartzite, and travertine. These heavy stone blocks were so prized that they were often transported from quarries located hundreds of kilometers away. Limestone was common and easy to extract from quarries on the east bank of the Nile. This particular limestone had marine fossils in it, however, preventing it from being easily decorated and polished. Used as the main building material, the structure would then be finished with a finer limestone that was polished smooth and decorated as needed. Limestone was used for the building of the first pyramids and for most of the religious buildings of the Old and Middle Kingdoms. Ancient Egyptians preferred to use sedimentary rock beds or layers like sandstone and limestone because they were often easier to extract. The common method used to extract stone was the open pit quarry. Stone cutters would find quality stone, shape, and dig it out on site. Open pit quarries enabled many workers to work simultaneously on many blocks, which allowed for better productivity. Workers would draw a large grid directly on the stone surface, taking care to leave a space between the blocks. This allowed them to isolate the different blocks and create a trench that would make the extraction easier. Stone workers used iron chisels for hard rock and bronze or copper tools for softer rocks such as limestone. Removing material between each block created a trench line. In some quarries, that trench was wide enough to accommodate a worker who would then cut the block entirely on site. For harder rocks like granite, workers cut a series of holes and hammered wooden wedges into them. They then soaked the wood until it swelled and caused the rock to split. The gallery extraction technique was used when the desired rock was buried under layers of rubble. This method was often necessary in order to find the whiter and finer limestone required for a smoother finish. The first step was for the stone workers to create an access pit that would allow them to reach the desired wall of stone. Once a wall of quality stone was exposed, workers could then cut out smaller blocks. This pit required a descending platform. Designed like a stairway, it allowed them to free multiple galleries of blocks. To cut the stone, they created a longitudinal kerf or slit and then cut the rock at a 90 degree angle. The lower side was determined along the geological layers or by using a horizontal cut. Wooden wedges were inserted in the rock and hammered in. Shock waves were then generated using hammers, fracturing the blocks at the seam. To maintain the stability of these mining pits over the course of quarrying, workers would leave support sections of unexcavated rock. In every quarry, dedicated shrines were established to offer protection for the workers. In particular, Circuit, the scorpion goddess, was considered a very powerful deity among quarry workers. Every mine and quarry of ancient Egypt included a scorpion charmer who was said to use magical powers to ward off the dangerous insects and keep the workers safe.
welcome to Workers and Transport. Whether workers were employed for the pyramid construction or at the quarries, the government supplied food and housing. Workers for the pyramids and royal necropolises were housed in more permanent villages such as the famous Deir el Medina. Quarry workers had more temporary lodgings. All skill levels were needed and utilized, from basic work hands to prepare the gypsum, to brick makers and sand carriers, to skilled stonemasons to shape the blocks. Skilled architects and engineers were employed year round, while support labor were often farmers who worked on the quarries or construction during the Nile's flood season. The basic laborers were hardworking and versatile. Many may have been farmers who joined the construction during the off season. Hieroglyphs found in the work villages listed assigned job titles. Archaeological research shows that no food was stored or prepared on site, but instead workers received abundant rations of bread, beer and meat. These rations were taken care of by an administration outside the village. Medical treatment was also available for those who were injured. While some quarries were close to the Nile, others were located across the desert and required long expeditions. These expeditions were sanctioned by the state. They involved complex logistics and required many participants. Transporting a block by land meant that workers had to overcome the weight and friction of the load. To solve this, they first dug a track in the ground. This path was sometimes reinforced with rails upon which a sled, used to ferry the blocks, would be pulled. Whenever possible, blocks were toppled from a higher elevation onto the sled. Workers then poured water onto the clay at the front of the sled, creating a slick surface to more easily move the load. It wasn't until the New Kingdom that animals were used to tow the burden. During flood season, the Nile was at its largest and deepest, which allowed the transportation of the heaviest and biggest loads. Quarries close to the river had troughs dug out to deliver the stones to the shoreline. Harbors and wharfs situated at the river's edge allowed the transfer of materials and supplies. Harbor warehouses accommodated additional stocks of stone both for the winter sailing season. The Iwadi al Jarf papyri detail a limestone load intended for the Khufu pyramid that weighed in at 70 to 80 tons, or 30 blocks. One papyrus is a fragment from a foreman's notes taken while working on the Great Pyramid. It details the transportation of limestone blocks from the Tura quarries to the construction site of the pyramid. The other papyri are shipping logs containing archives of the sailors assigned to sail the Red Sea and the Nile. Stone cargo generally weighed 15 tons per boat, amounting to roughly six or seven blocks per trip. For heavier loads such as obelisks, monolithic pillars, or gigantic statues, larger boats were used. These transports are the ones typically showcased on temple walls. River transportation was the most efficient way to ferry stone blocks between the quarry and the construction site. Blocks were transported by flotillas of several types of boats. The most detailed illustration of transport by river is a relief of Queen Hatshepsut's barge with an accompanying flotilla. Welcome to Agriculture and Seasons. Whoa. While crops were cultivated in different oases around the desert, most of the arable lands were near the Nile. 
Two types of cereal grain were cultivated, barley and an ancient wheat known as emmer. These two key ingredients contributed in establishing bread and beer as the staple of the Egyptian diet and the basis of its economy. Whoa. The Ptolemaic era created an agricultural revolution with the introduction of advanced agricultural techniques and new grain types such as rice, durum wheat and pearl millet. The resulting agricultural mass production greatly increased the economy of ancient Egypt. It also prompted the development of storage and transportation, allowing long-distance trade with other regions. Whoa. Both bread and beer rations were part of a system of barter payment. The state used those goods to pay wages for those who worked in the quarries and at the construction sites. Beer was so important to ancient Egyptians, they had a goddess of beer brewing, Tenenet. Tenenet is seen in many paintings and sculptures with beer, and women are depicted as the primary beer makers. In order to increase agricultural production, fertile land was divided into plots and large agricultural villages were encouraged. The state and temples were the biggest landowners. Depending on the region, fertile land was managed by civil servants or rented to individuals. Ancient Egyptians relied on rudimentary tools for land cultivation. Soil was broken down with hoes and wing plows were used to make furrows. The three seasons known as Aket, Peret, and Shemu corresponded to a specific phase of the agricultural process and the river's natural changes. Aket was the time of the flood, beginning with the appearance of the star Sirius in July. Peret was the time when lands were cultivated, plowed, and sown. This fell between October and November. Shemu ran from May to September and was when harvesting and taxation began. The Pharaoh's duty was to uphold order against chaos and provide for his people. Priests and local governors also wanted to appear as protectors of the people. However, any variation in the Nile's seasons could cause water shortages. This had devastating consequences on wheat and barley crops. The pharaoh, administrators, and priests knew they needed to demonstrate their ability to prevent such a catastrophe from happening. And so they invented the story which would be inscribed upon the famine stela. The story begins with the pharaoh worried for his people. The Nile hasn't flooded in years and his people are starving. In search of the origins of the flooding, Djoser seeks out Kanum, the protector god of the region and the source of the drought. Djoser gives the god offerings and orders his priests to restore the temple of Kanum. These offerings please the god and the floods are restored. This story was intended to highlight the importance of the deity in everyone's daily lives, while also demonstrating the crucial role that the priests and the king played in feeding and protecting the people of Egypt. Welcome to Ancient Egyptian Cultivation. The new grain types of the Ptolemaic period required a great deal of water. Farmers needed to ensure they had effective, consistent irrigation. The Nile's rising and receding waters naturally irrigated most of the crops. Areas where the Nile didn't reach, such as gardens and vegetable plots, required an irrigation tool known as the shadouf. The shadouf allowed easy transport of water from its source. 
It consisted of a tall wooden frame with a long pivoting pole and suspended bucket. The system could be raised and lowered with little effort. Later, a sakya, or water wheel, was invented. The sakya needed animals to turn the wheel, which rotated buckets through the water. It drew the water to an elevation of 3.5 meters and enabled a great deal of control over the irrigation process. This improvement supplied larger areas and thus resulted in larger harvests. The threshing process separated the grain from its husk. Workers would spread the ears on clean ground. Oxen, cows, or donkeys were then guided back and forth to trample the grain. This continuous movement worked the grain loose while preventing the animals from eating it. Unwanted chaff and straw were swept away or gathered and added to the mud used to make bricks to make them stronger. Winnowing was the stage where workers used wooden scoops to throw ears in the air. The wind carried off the chaff leaving the heavier seeds to fall to the ground. This action was repeated until the undesired materials were sifted out. Grain waste was mixed with manure or other organic substances to produce brick-shaped dung loaves that could be easily burned. A standardized brick size enabled Egyptians to mass produce this byproduct and use it as a commodity. Transporting large amounts of grain required ships equipped to carry heavy loads. These goods were moved during the Nile's flooding season, when the river was deep enough for large ships. The transports stopped at checkpoints to accommodate customs and police controls, as well as for technical requirements and weather conditions. Having reached Alexandria's inner harbor, the wheat was unloaded under the supervision of a civil servant in charge of wheat management. Portions were distributed to Alexandria's city market, and the remaining stockpile was either exported or stored in warehouses. Grain storage facilities were located across all of Egypt. Temples and institutions had large silos, while individual houses had storage sheds. In some houses, arched cellars were built into the foundations. These watertight chambers were accessible from the ground floor through a trapdoor. Royal granaries acted as the storehouse and distribution centers and managed state payments to civil servants, soldiers, and the police. Though plastered on the inside, Silos weren't completely sealed, and so remained susceptible to mice infestations. When the grain was ready for processing, it was poured into bowls and pounded into a coarse flour. That flour was then passed through a sieve to make it of finer quality and further ground between stones. Ancient Egyptians did not stock flour. Instead, fresh grain was portioned out each time to produce flour as it was needed. The sieves used by ancient Egyptians were unable to filter out sand and stones. Grit often passed into the flour, causing long-term tooth abrasions among all classes of Egyptians. Welcome to Domesticated Animals of Ancient Egypt. Agriculture and domesticated livestock were introduced 6,000 years ago. Archaeologists have found traces of cattle, donkeys, pigs, and dogs. Dromedary are thought to have been introduced during the Persian invasion. 
Pets were deeply cherished in ancient Egypt. Many illustrations of children often include a pet in the depiction. One of ancient Egypt's most iconic animals, the cat, wasn't adopted into their daily life until the Middle Kingdom. Since they were so highly capable of killing snakes and rodents, cats were present throughout every period. However, they only became pets sometime during the Middle Kingdom. Prince Thutmose, son of Amenhotep III, had his cat Tamu laid to rest in its own sarcophagi. The earliest reference to dogs dates back to 5000 BCE. They were popular pets, as they helped hunters and protected herds. They were closely linked to Anubis, the jackal-headed god. Baboons, monkeys, and even falcons were tamed as pets. Each was mummified and buried with as much ceremony as any family member. Welcome to Ancient Egyptian Medicine. Evidence of advanced medical procedures have been found on mummies, and ancient Egyptians left detailed medical writings from diagnosis to follow-up treatment. One of the oldest known surgical studies is the Edwin Smith papyrus. It's one of the first documents in history that notes an association between the integrity of the brain and cognitive functions including cases of ocular complications and paralysis following head trauma. Vinegar-treated marble stone from Memphis was used as an anesthetic. Another similar document, the Ebers Medical Papyrus, is over 20 meters long and 30 centimeters wide. It details treatments of 48 surgical cases and contains 877 paragraphs describing various diseases. Alongside accurate and factual scientific approaches, the papyrus has more than 700 magic formulas and incantations to ward off demons and disease. This demonstrates how ancient Egyptians believed in a harmonious balance between religion and science. Remedies were considered as medicine and carried by doctors and priests. Village doctors often had another job alongside their medical duties and the preparation of medicines. A cure for blindness was made of fermented honey, ochre, and coal. The science behind it was that honey functioned as an antiseptic and antibacterial, while ochre would reduce the swelling. All of their knowledge did not always suffice. Ramses II died of an infection caused by an abscessed tooth. Welcome to Leather and Linen in Ancient Egypt. Tanning, a process which dates from prehistoric times, was present although not highly valued in Egypt due to the heat. Leather was reserved mainly for things such as sandals, leather bags, dagger sheaths, quivers, and other similar items. Leopard hides, unlike regular leather, were highly valued and usually worn by priests. Valued for its coolness and freshness in hot weather, linen was the fiber most commonly used for fabrics and textiles. It was produced from flax, which was plentiful in Egypt. Fibers were usually dyed before weaving. While color was used in the production of textiles, dyes weren't commonly used for clothing, and most Egyptians wore white. 
The color represented spiritual purity, a goal to reach for every day of one's mortal life. Various shades were achieved using woad, a dye produced from the leaves of Isotus tinctoria. The plant was cultivated for this purpose within the Nile Delta and allowed for the creation of various colors. For example, different maceration times of the leaves would result in colors ranging from red to green, while adding in limestone shifted it to blue. During the Greco-Roman period, other ingredients were found, resulting in a wider range of colors. This area's style is strongly influenced by the dye baths and tanneries of modern-day Fes in Morocco. This helped Ubisoft envision what such locations might have been like in ancient Egypt. While this tannery is within the city walls, back then they were often found outside the city boundaries. The tanner's trade was considered off-putting by the Greeks, as all these operations resulted in noxious smells. Welcome to Ancient Egyptian Fashions. Learning what life was like for ancient Egyptians presents many differences and yet also surprising similarities to how people might live today. Understanding the daily lives of regular citizens so many thousands of years ago is ultimately what connects us as human beings. Whoa. Jewelry was a popular item among ancient Egyptians of all social standing. Both men and women wore earrings, rings, and bracelets. Status determined how much jewelry a person wore and what it was made of. Common folk wore pearl necklaces, simple bracelets, and leather bangles. Brightly colored earthenware and glass paste were a favorite enhancement. The jewelry of the elite was made from gold, silver, and other precious stones. Because gold never lost its shine, it was considered akin to the flesh of the gods. Wide jeweled collars were a favorite. Made with rows of beads formed into patterns of animals or flowers, the soft chiming sounds they made were thought to appease the gods. Though idealized, tomb paintings are a catalog of the changing fashions of ancient Egypt from the Old to the New Kingdom. Egyptians took appearance and cleanliness very seriously and were diligent about their fashion, hair, and jewelry as well as their grooming habits. The fabric of ancient Egyptian clothing was almost entirely made from various grades of linen, Linen was commonly white, draped over the body, and cinched at the waist, though some garments were sewn or tailored. Wealthy men wore long tunics, loincloths, or kilts, while poor men only wore loincloths. Women wore long dresses, with differences residing in the quality of the fabric, depending on social status. Egyptians commonly went barefoot, but could also wear sandals made from papyrus fiber or leather. Cosmetics, including concoctions to prevent body odor and bad breath, were an integral part of everyday life for Egyptians. Used by both men and women, cosmetics were used as moisturizing ointments and sun protection as much as for beautification. Red ochre, a natural clay, was the most readily available cosmetic to tint lips and cheeks. Henna was used on nails and lips, and as hair coloring. It was also favored by richer women to decorate their palms and the soles of their feet. Egyptians believed coal had magical powers, wearing it as black eyeliner to protect their eyes from the sun and to prevent eye infections from particles in the flooded Nile River. A special green coal, made from ground malachite, was worn for ceremonies and religious rituals. 
C'est mon. Bon. Women and teenage girls wore their hair long and often braided. Wealthier women included carved combs or hairpins. The length of men's hair rarely dropped past the shoulders. They were mostly clean-shaven during the dynastic period, a trend began by the elite and soon adopted by the general populace. Queen Hatshepsut donned an artificial beard when she became pharaoh. Wigs were very popular, used for special occasions or to conceal gray hair or baldness. They were fastened in place with beeswax. The most expensive wigs were made from human hair and reserved for royalty. Other wigs were composed of linen, wool, or animal hair. Prepubescent children generally had their heads shaved. Young girls kept some strands intact, while young boys had a braid worn on the side. Welcome to Evolution of Pottery in Ancient Egypt. Excavations all over Egypt have uncovered enormous quantities of pottery vessels of all shapes and sizes. The production of pottery was mainly confined to the outskirts of settlements due to the materials required and to keep the kiln smoke away from inhabited spaces. The function of the product determined the selection of the raw material, its treatment, its form, as well as the finishing of the surface. Pottery was essential to ancient Egyptians' daily lives. It was used in all aspects of life, from the storage of grains and liquids to containers within the tombs of necropolises. The most common pottery was made from Nile silt that resulted in a reddish-brown clay. Limestone clay, which made for more attractive pottery, was only found in Upper Egypt. Early pots were made from pinched or coiled clay. Chopped straw, ashes, and other minerals were added, and the mixture was then smoothed and decorated before being put in the oven. Pots were fired in bonfires or enclosed within a brick kiln. The potter's wheel was utilized during the Old Kingdom. Pottery became smoother and more polished, similar to river stones. It was decorated primarily in red pigment, with the black color achieved by exposing it to smoke. Pottery workshops were attached to palaces or temples, and around the late period, specialized workshops began to appear. Quartzite particles, which created the rich blue or green glazing, became common during the New Kingdom. Mediterranean motifs and tin-based glazing came with the Greco-Roman era. Potsherds could be found anywhere and were the most common canvas for writing or drawing, in comparison to the more expensive papyrus sheets. Named after their Greek description, Ostraca contained daily life records, letters, or could be drawn upon. Artists drew sketches for temples and tombs, or simply for leisure. Welcome to the Egyptian household. In pre-Greco-Roman culture, women were considered equal to men in many matters. They owned property, testified in court, could divorce and inherit. Until the Greeks and Romans restricted their rights, Egyptian women could take over their deceased husband's trade. Marriage contracts included mentions of allowances and items of value brought to the marriage by the woman which would forever belong to her. Mm. 
Certain professions were open only to women, such as weaving or professional mourning, while others were available to both genders, including working as servants for the rich households. Social status did have an impact, though. The higher in status, the easier it was to obtain education and access different professions. Homes were generally composed of three rooms. First, there was the entrance, furnished with a small bench of brick, probably intended for a statue and protective divinity. Then there was the ceremonial room, meant to receive guests. The last room was either a bedroom or kitchen. Furniture consisted of basic chairs, chests, and storage. Tables were not used for family dinners. Instead, each individual had a small table of their own. Marriages were a social contract rather than a religious construct. Family was vitally important to ancient Egyptians, and children were considered a blessing from the gods. The father, mother, and their children were the nucleus of the family, and cohabitation sometimes extended to mothers-in-law sisters, aunts, and sisters-in-law. <laughs> Status and wealth played a large role in the style and size of ancient Egyptian homes. Commoners' houses were built with sun-baked mud bricks. Wealthier homes were often painted in white and decorated with various motifs. Town officials and the rich lived in mansions with numerous rooms that were luxuriously decorated. Only temples and tombs meant to last for all eternity were built with stone. <laughs> Funeral stone inscriptions focused on the main member of a household. Encircling this person would then be a spouse, parents, and children, possibly even siblings. These stones were so structured because there were no surnames in ancient Egyptian culture. Parents and children were a sort of family tree, which allowed for the identification of the deceased. Welcome to Bread and Beer. While the Mesopotamians invented beer, including using a straw to avoid the sediments and herbs, ancient Egyptians perfected the brewing method. Egyptian beer's quality was determined by alcohol strength, color, and flavor. During the Pharaonic era, beer was the most commonly used and important alcoholic beverage. The state and temples used it, along with bread, as payment to workers, and it was included on the lists of food offerings to the gods and the deceased. Beer was the popular drink of ceremonies and festivals. The festival of drunkenness was even dedicated to it. Considered to be quite nutritional, beer was also significant in the day-to-day -day lives of ancient Egyptians. Egyptian adults and children consumed beer with all of their meals and medical texts include hundreds of remedies that contain beer. It remained the most popular alcoholic beverage until the Roman era. Recipes for beer varied over time and depended on the quality of the materials. Bakers and brewers typically worked alongside one another at the same workshop or house. Many families often produced the quantity appropriate to their own consumption with better quality beers produced for festivals and other special occasions. The most basic recipe used malted cereal as the main ingredient. Fruits such as dates were added along with honey and spices. Recipes. Once baked, bread would be crumbled into the brew to start the fermentation process. Adding grain enzymes would break down the starches, turning them into sugar and creating a thick mash.
Once ready, the bread and grain mixture was compressed and then strained through a sieve with water into the mix of malt beer. Once fermented, the beer mash was transferred to large containers and again compressed by foot or with pestles. Once smooth, the beer was stored in pottery jars and sealed with a clay stopper. It probably couldn't be kept for long and likely had a thick, pasty appearance and texture. Very little was wasted. Leftover grains were reused to make sourdough bread or combined with the next batch of beer. While there are many ancient accounts for making bread, most of the knowledge known about ancient Egyptian brewing comes from an account by the alchemist Zosimus over 300 years after Cleopatra's reign. More recently, Dr. Delwyn Samuel, an archaeobotanist, has proposed alternate antique techniques to brew beer. However, experts are unable to replicate an authentic beer since not all of the techniques and ingredients used by ancient Egyptians are known yet. Food was prepared on the floor until the Middle Kingdom when cooking benches were introduced. The introduction of durum wheat improved bread quality, meaning that the upper and middle classes ate better. The poor, however, still may do with a diet consisting of a gruel made of vegetables, softened bread, or barley. Dough was kneaded by hand or foot, and when sufficiently blended, additional items were added, such as fruits, nuts, honey, and spices. To leaven the bread, they added sourdough or leaven from beer brewing. Ovens were circular or beehive shaped and made with clay or brick. If there was no oven at all, a bread maker used the hot sand to bake flatbread, a technique still in use by some Berbers today. Ancient Egyptians always had to fight off the omnipresent sand particles that were blown towards them. Despite their best efforts, sand regularly made its way into their food. Additionally, particles from the grain grinding stone tools and ovens they used also contributed to attrition and prematurely worn teeth. The team tried to portray this through toothache animations and commoners sweeping sand off. Welcome to Wine in Ancient Egypt. When the god Horus lost his eye in a war with Seth, the ancient Egyptians believed the eye turned into a vine and the vine's tears became wine. Early texts dating back to 3150 BCE contain the hieroglyph for vine. Regarded as extremely valuable, wine was highly sought after by the elite. It was also an essential part of many religious ceremonies. A millennia-old tradition, grape cultivation and wine production was regimented in the way typical of ancient Egyptian bureaucracy. Egyptians kept careful records of winemakers, which they clearly identified on labels. Every landowner with a modicum of self-respect usually kept a vineyard. This held particularly true in the regions of the Fayum and the Nile Delta. Documentation shows that only certain craftsfolk were allowed to provide the containers required to store and transport wine. That and rigorous quality control checks established for every step of wine production shows that ancient Egyptians knew that the quality and longevity of wine could easily be affected by any number of variables, which they paid careful attention to. Egyptians had different kinds of wines, most of which ranged in quality from good to very good. The sweet shade, to which honey had been added. The soft nejem, obtained by drying the grapes in the sun. The ma, reserved for religious ceremonies. And finally, there was the peor, the mediocre rated wine, resulting from the second pressing of grapes and reserved for a less discerning palate. 
Welcome to Oil in Ancient Egypt. Castor, sesame, and moringa were the source of the most common oils in ancient Egypt. Oil was used for various purposes, cosmetics, medical treatments, nutrition, perfume, athletics, and rituals, to name a few. The team decided to use oil as an explosive to add more gameplay opportunities for the player. Ancient Egyptians originally used castor oil in wick lamps, but also for cosmetics, such as facial and hair treatments. There is mention in some papyrus of castor oil being prescribed to treat constipation and help pregnant women. Castor beans were found in ancient Egyptian tombs as early as 4000 BCE. Castor oil was made by pressing the beans from the plant of the same name. Olive trees were present though scarce in ancient Egypt's early history, and olives were mostly imported from Syria and Palestine. Their use and cultivation remained uncommon until the mass arrival of Greek settlers during the reign of the Ptolemies, when demand increased sharply. Olive trees were normally found in the region of the Fayum and the lands surrounding Alexandria. 